because Brno is the largest conglomeration of independent wages. Thanks for inviting me, and uh, I'm actually not originally from Prague, I just live there, so don't hate me because of that. <laughs> uh, the screen is a bit challenging, let's see how the slides work. If you have the feeling that you can't read the slides on the side, just let me know and I will try to show them uh, only on the smaller part in the middle. And. Uh, Yes, yeah, so I'm Jakub Scholz, I'm not that interesting to be honest. Uh, but uh, what I do while working for Red Hat is mainly focusing on uh, two things. One thing is Apache Kafka, and the other thing is uh, running Apache Kafka on OpenShift and Kubernetes. And uh, that's what I will talk a bit about today. So, uh, how many of you know Apache Kafka? How many of you heard about it? Everyone, nice. How many of you are actually using it? It's still quite a lot. Usually, a lot of people know it, but nobody's using it. Uh, so maybe this will be all uh, stuff you know. But uh, Apache Kafka is something that can be called many different names and titles. One of the, the fancy one is streaming data platform. Some people use it uh, and call it just uh, regular pub sub messaging. Uh, Technically, it's actually implemented as a distributed commit log, so that's uh, how it actually works. But all these are true, and the main features uh, really are uh, horizontal scalability, so it can scale uh, quite well in uh, certain use cases, not in all of them. Uh, it can be also form tolerant, and uh, it's immutable, which is uh, also a nice thing for some use cases. And what uh, I always try to call out is uh, that Kafka is not just the messaging broker itself, but it's really more an ecosystem of a different thing. So directly in the Apache Kafka project itself, you have the things like the Kafka Connect, or uh, Kafka Streams, or Kafka Mirror Maker. But there's a lot of stuff uh, outside of the Apache Kafka project itself. There's uh, things like KSQL for uh, SQL-based processing of data. There's things like Apache Spark, for example, which have kind of first-class support for uh, Kafka for getting the data from it and so on. So uh, the broker itself, it's nice, it works perfectly in most cases. Uh, but really the ecosystem is what makes it much more valuable. The second project I will talk about is a project called Streamzy. That's something that we started at uh, Red Hat. And the main goal uh, of this project, which is of course open source and uh, so on, is uh, to get Kafka to become a first class citizen on OpenShift and Kubernetes. So the project itself supports <coughs> Kubernetes as well. It's not just that because we are Red Hat uh, and we have OpenShift that everything works only on OpenShift. And uh, it provides two main things. It's the Docker images, the container images for the different components. But more important is the operators for managing uh, and running the Kafka clusters, Kafka Connect clusters, in Kafka users and so on. Because what we want to do is to really make using Kafka on Kubernetes kind of, we call it Kubernetes native, so that you don't need uh, to know any Kafka stuff and so on. Uh, how many of you heard about operators? That's everyone, so I uh, won't spend that much time. It will be a quick talk if you know everything, guys. <laughs> so, uh, in some talks I have these boring slides which show how the operators actually work. Uh, this is a bit different slide, that's uh, how I would say the operator works in the actual Kubernetes environment. It's like this eagle or hawk which is flying over the Kubernetes API and watching for the resources and when it sees something and it kind of drops down and uh, fix it. So that's how uh, human operators work if you run something in production. And that's how the operators on Kubernetes should run as well. Sometimes the eagles or the hawks are a bit crippled and not that good, but uh, <laughs> you have to start somewhere, right? This is the more traditional slide which shows uh, how the Streamzy operator actually works uh, when you want to deploy Kafka cluster. 
So uh, you get the operator running, then you create a custom resource, and it will start this whole uh, orchestration of the Zookeeper cluster, which is a dependency for the Kafka brokers. Then it does the Kafka brokers uh, and gets the Kafka cluster deployed, and then it deploys something called topic and user operators, which I will talk a bit more in uh, one of the next slides. And then, because you all know operators, uh, you know what will happen on the next slide, so when you change the custom resource, everything will be reconfigured, updated, and so on. So let's uh, not waste the time on that. And uh, let's further look at uh, how it actually works. And the demo is live, so if it doesn't work, then uh, yeah, you know how it is. So I have already OpenShift cluster. I'm not sure that we are getting the audio. Maybe this way it's better. So I have the OpenShift cluster running already here locally. And uh, to deploy the operator, I can use several things. So uh, I can really do it uh, old fashioned uh, using these. Uh, oh, let's do it differently. Let's do it this way. So I have this uh, bunch of YAML files which I can just apply, which create the different resources like the, uh, the custom resources, the RBEC stuff and so on. And uh, that will get it uh, installed. I have some other options as well. So uh, I don't know whether you heard about it, but there's this project called operatorhub.io where we have a lot of different uh, operators available. So it's kind of a library with uh, operators. It doesn't look so great when it's zoomed. There's really a lot of operators and the Streamsy operator is uh, one of them. And when you click this magic install button, then you get this uh, command which you can just copy paste to install it. So that's kind of an uh, easier way you don't have to download uh, anything. But I'm actually gonna do it now the old school way, so I'm just going to do OC apply. Can you please the window because we can't see the command you are Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this will be fun. <laughs> just, just move the window up. Ah, you want to make it easy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Another question, could you please uh, turn the microphone a little bit to the, I don't know, your life? Yeah. Because it's getting, oh. no, to you, to you, to you, to you. Because it's getting a bit echo, echo yeah. from the awesome. Like this? You think it will be better? It's good. Let's see. We'll see. We'll see. Like a bit further away. I can try just scream and maybe it will be better in the... <laughs> microphone. <laughs> uh, if you don't hear me at the back, uh, let me know to speak louder. So uh, what I will really do now is uh, I will just do OC apply on all these YAML files, get them installed, and that will install the operator, and now I can uh, get the Kafka cluster running. So uh, that's again, if you are familiar with OpenShift and Kubernetes, then you know everything's YAML files. YAML is amazing, YAML is much better than JSON. It's even much better than XML and other great things. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this is the custom resource for the, for the Kafka cluster. You can see here is kind Kafka and so on. Uh, I guess if you know operators, you are probably familiar with uh, what custom resources are, so I don't need to go into the details. So in the, in the Kafka resource, it's really the blueprint for the Kafka cluster, where uh, you can describe the different aspects of the Kafka cluster, like the number of nodes, the resources which it should use, uh, different JVM options, you can configure the listeners and the security and so on. And then uh, when you do OC apply, the operator will find it, like the eagle, <laughs> and uh, we'll start deploying it. So uh, OC apply. Now it created the custom resource, and I can now just watch for the pods uh, as the cluster is starting. So uh, it first always has to start a zookeeper cluster and bootstrap it, and only when the zookeeper cluster is running, it will actually move on 
and deploy the Kafka brokers themselves. And uh, then uh, it will move to the user and uh, entity operators and so on. What I would like to point out here is uh, one of the things with the user and topic operators and so on, which make it so Kubernetes native, uh, is uh, that uh, it's actually super easy to do the demo with the real authentication and authorization and so on. So all the applications I will be showing in the demo, they will be actually using more than just some anonymous connections without any security, but they will be using encryption, they will be using authentication, using TLS certificates, they will have ACLs and so on. So that basically got our cluster running. And uh, what's next? If I manage to get the slides. Uh, yeah, this looks reasonably readable <laughs> on the wall. So, uh, yeah, I already talked about the topic and user operators. What they actually do is uh, they manage the users and the topics for your cluster. So, getting a running Kafka cluster is nice, but when you have some applications, you actually want them to send the data or receive the data from some topics. You want them to authenticate with some username, have some ACLs and so on. And that's what we are trying to do with these uh, topic and user operators. Obviously, the topic one works for topics, the user one works for users. So uh, you can actually specify everything in the YAMLs. You can uh, keep it with your application because the YAML is just a text file, so it's super easy to store it somewhere uh, in your GitHub repository, for example, next to the code which is actually receiving the messages and so on. And uh, you also don't need to learn any special Kafka commands for creating the users and managing the ACLs because uh, you can just use what you know from Kubernetes and OpenShift uh, command line tools and YAMLs and so on. So uh, let's have a look a bit uh, how that works. So let's check if the cluster is up and running, which uh, Luckily it is. And uh, let's check a different YAML file, which uh, as you can see, I hope you can read it even from the, from the back. Yes. So as you can see, this is not kind Kafka, this is now kind Kafka user, and that defines a user for uh, our application. So uh, what I have here in the specification is I specify the type of authentication which the user should use. So in this case, it's uh, authentication which is done using uh, TLS client certificates. So when you create this custom resource, the user operator will see it, it will see, okay, this user should use TLS certificates for authentication. It will automatically generate a new certificate in a secret, which the user can just use uh, to connect to the Kafka brokers. And then in this authorization section, you can also specify different ACLs like uh, Okay, it can read from some topics, it can write to some topics, it can create some topics. So we can specify all of this in the YAML file and it can really traverse the whole uh, life cycle of the application through development. Yeah, question? So you're using the client certificate for mutual authentication. Yeah. So how, how the servers know what certificate you trust? So basically what happens when the Kafka cluster is deployed is when you have the Client authentication enabled using the TLS certificates. It will create, uh, currently, it will create uh, uh, basically a self signed CA for the cluster. And it will use this CA to sign the client certificates uh, to authenticate. So, uh, this is the current solution, and then uh, more, let's say, uh, for the future, uh, ideally, we need to find time to also integrate it with things like Vault and CyberArk and so on, so that the certificates are managed and stored a bit more securely. Thank you. Yeah, another um, question? More for, for people and for myself, uh, since you are actually showing this on OpenShift, uh, the question is, does it also work like Kubernetes? Because I know that we have people in the audience who are actually using Kubernetes in their company. Yeah, so everything I'm showing in this demo works fine on uh, Kubernetes. There are some special things which uh, are OpenShift only, but they have always some alternative which you can use on, use on Kubernetes. So if you know OpenShift, there are these roads implemented using this HA proxy, 
which uh, kind of ingress is the counterpart on Kubernetes. So we have support for the roads, but you don't have to use them. You can use, for example, ingress, node boards, or load balancers. Uh, similarly, when I will be showing later Kafka Connect, on OpenShift, you can use the source to image framework and the OpenShift builds to automatically build a new image with new Kafka Connect uh, connectors. That's not available on Kubernetes, so they're kind of, uh, you have to go the more traditional CI way that you use basically the streams image as a base image and just uh, in some CI, for example, add the jar files with additional connectors to it, which I would actually argue is anyway much better than the source to image stuff. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, when we are in the TL section, uh, is it supported to generate uh, client certificates for stuff that runs outside of Kubernetes? So you can do it this way, but you would basically, so the user operator will always generate the certificates in uh, the secret, and you would kind of need to export it from the secret into a file and then use the file outside. But you can use it from outside as well. So that's the Kafka user resource. And uh, what we also plan here in the future is to, for example, add support for uh, quotas so that you can specify also how many messages the users uh, can be sending or receiving uh, to make sure that the cluster works even with some uh, users which may be misbehaved. This is another resource. This is the Kafka topic resource, which uh, surprisingly specifies the Kafka topic, which is application will use. And you can see here the basic configuration things like number of partitions, number of replicas for the Kafka replication. There is also this uh, config section where you can go a bit more into the details. If you don't want to use anything special, just want to use the default, you don't need to use it. Uh, if you have something special, you can use the special things there, like uh, here I have a few options just to show off. And then uh, the actual application is just a regular deployment, which uh, most of you probably know quite well. The only thing which I want to show you here is that when your application runs inside the cluster, inside your Kubernetes or OpenShift cluster, you don't need to do any copying of the certificates and so on. You can really just uh, map it from the secret into a volume, or in this case, uh, I use environment variable and then use it in your application. You don't need to do anything special with it, so uh, it really just uh, binds together. It's just when your client runs outside, or possibly in a different OpenShift cluster, when you actually have to copy the secrets with the certificate somewhere. And uh, that's basically YAML as any other. And uh, OC apply, we're getting deployed. Yeah. Do you always need to have the, the subject as generated? Can you provide them from the outside? So uh, for the users, you can basically just provide your own CA certificate. And then it's up to you how you will, how you can kind of, if you provide a CA certificate, including the private key, then uh, the user operator can still kind of manage the uh, signing of the keys for the clients for you. You can also kind of just provide the CA and then uh, use whatever mechanism you want to use to generate the user certificates uh, for the applications. Right, so now we deployed some application. And uh, before we look what we actually deployed, let's have a look at the next slide. So one of the things uh, how we will see Kafka used quite often is different event-driven architectures. So uh, how many of you know what event-driven systems or architectures mean? Yeah, it's quite a lot. Not everyone. So basically, Kafka is a great tool for event-driven architectures. It was pretty much uh, designed for this purpose uh, at LinkedIn originally. So uh, it can act easily as a kind of the backbone which connects your microservices which send their events uh, and uh, other microservices consume them and do some analytics and stream processing and so on. Uh, so basically, for those who are not sure what this means, uh, every time some event happens somewhere, some message is sent into the topic, 
because Kafka can store the messages for quite a long time, as long as you have enough disk space. Uh, then uh, it means that these events can be really stored long term. They can be, for example, used as an audit trail. That's where the mutability is a uh, quite important feature. You can use it for things like uh, even sourcing and analytics of uh, logs, metrics, and so on, because all these things are basically events. The events can have different forms, so for example, one way to distinguish them is that some of them might be kind of absolute events, like uh, the temperature in this room is uh, 21 degrees. Some of them might be more relative, uh, like uh, the temperature in this room just increased by one degree because we are sitting here. Uh, so the main difference there is that with some of them you just get the last message and you know the actual state with the others you might need to kind of reprocess the whole log of the events to actually find out the state. And uh, I'm telling you this because this is what I will use in my application. So how many of you own some uh, shares of some company, try to do some trading uh, or something like that? Okay, that's the question where I get only two or three hands. <laughs> so, uh, Right, even when you didn't do it, uh, you probably know the principles, right? You have some exchanges where you can go, you can buy some shares of some companies, you can sell them, and uh, of course you will make millions and you will not need to work anymore and so on. So uh, that's exactly what this application is about. So in this first part, I will have an application which is basically collecting the uh, information about some trades. So when someone, for example, me was buying some shares, so because we are Red Hat, uh, it's like uh, the first event is buying 100 uh, shares of Red Hat, which basically gets written into the Kafka topic as a message with a key, which is the, the ticker for the Red Hat shares, which is RHT, and then the amount of the shares which we bought. And uh, because Red Hat is great, it's another 50 shares, right? Uh, there's this IBM thing, so uh, <laughs> yeah, let's buy something of the IBM. Uh, yeah, maybe let's sell some of the Red Hat shares. Uh, maybe the things, uh, yeah, we will see. Maybe let's hedge ourselves with buying some Amazon shares and so on. So, all these events basically uh, are written into the lock as messages. And because these are kind of the relative events, the nice thing is that alone they don't necessarily mean much, right? So when you look at this uh, event, which uh, is about selling 25 Red Hat shares, it doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't mean that I don't have any shares anymore. Uh, it's really just something what happened, right? So uh, we first collect these events, and then later we can do some processing to do some interesting stuff with this. And, uh, that's pretty much what this application does uh, to just uh, get some events. I have uh, this super simple UI where I can now enter all these uh, trades like uh, buying 100 Red Hat shares, uh, buying another 50 Red Hat shares, maybe do some selling so that we later see that it works. Uh, properly, so I will just say minus 25, and uh, don't worry, I won't do all the events which are on the slide. Uh, but let's do one more, let's do the IBM one. And basically, as you see in the UI, these are really locked as events into the topic, and uh, these are just sitting there, living there, and later we will show how can Kafka make it easy to process this. So I actually used the kind of a crappy UI for entering the events, but in reality, you have always some external systems uh, around your Kafka cluster, and you need to get the data in and out of Kafka. And what you can use for that is uh, the Kafka Connect. So everyone knew Kafka, a lot of people use Kafka. How many of you are using Kafka Connect? Right, no hands. Interesting. So Kafka Connect is really a framework which can make it easy for you to get uh, 
data from some other systems into your Kafka cluster, into your Kafka topics. Or, of course, on the other side, uh, you can also use it to get the data out of the Kafka Connect into some external system. And uh, it's really a framework. So uh, you deploy some Kafka Connect workers, and onto these you can then deploy and configure the connectors, which will communicate with the different uh, outside systems. These connectors are always two types. There's a source connector for getting data into Kafka, and the sync connector for getting data out of Kafka. And then uh, there's a lot of third-party connectors uh, available, which uh, you can pretty much just download, configure, and use. So you don't have to write anything, and it's like, uh, if you need to connect Kafka with some external messaging systems, like uh, anything that supports JMS or things like uh, Amazon uh, SNS or SQS services, uh, WebSphere MQ and so on. There are databases which, which, which you can communicate, often either using the JDBC drivers, which basically can support uh, most databases, or using the change data capture tools like uh, Debezium, which will basically connect your database and automatically get out of the transaction logs the events when you modify some, uh, some records in the database to automatically generate Kafka events, which can be later processed. And uh, there's really a lot more connectors. I think uh, the good connectors with some reasonable quality is around 50 to 100 different connectors for different systems. There's social networks, there's things like Amazon S3 and so on. But you can also use the API to write your own connector. So it's really just an uh, interface or uh, to be more precise, it's just a Java class which you extend. And you can write your own connectors to integrate with your own systems, which uh, in some cases it's kind of an uh, easier way how to do the things uh, instead of using the Kafka clients to produce and uh, consume messages. I have a question there. Yeah? Regarding connectors, you mentioned 50 connectors. How are they managed? They are under Kafka umbrella? Or no, so how it works? The connectors, so for those who didn't hear that, the question was uh, how are the Kafka connectors managed, whether they are under the Apache Kafka project and so on. Uh, they are not, they are kind of part of the wider ecosystem. So basically different companies uh, Draw different connectors depending on what they needed, and they basically share them as an open source on, uh, yeah, on GitHub. And then so. there is compatibility challenge. Uh, not really, because there is they have they all have to run within Kafka Connect. So, so always the latest version. So I guess the API can change. The API is fairly stable, so there are not that many problems. But yes, you might need to use, depending on what Kafka version you use, you might need to use different versions of these connectors. Uh, but really, the connector API, that's fairly stable, so usually there's not really the problem with the, with the different Kafka versions. Uh, of course, since it's not under the Apache uh, foundation, there are other things like uh, yeah, it's just some companies with up account and so on. So it's just by the ecosystem. The, the API itself, is it part of Apache Kafka or is it yes. part of the confluence? No, that's part of Apache Kafka. So actually, let me show you a bit more about Kafka Connect. So let me first uh, have a look at how we can deploy it. So uh, a lot of people, when they hear Kafka Connect and connectors, they think that these are somehow running directly inside the brokers. But that's not the case. The Kafka Connect is a really standalone framework which runs as a separate processes, separate JVMs. Uh, for example, for production, all to the Kafka Connect can host in the same work a lot of different connectors for stability and so on. It might be for production, for example, better to have anyway separate Kafka Connect installations for the different connectors so that one of them doesn't misbehave and crash the whole JVM and so on. But because it's a separate application, uh, we again need to go through the whole thing as before. So we deploy the Kafka topic which it will use. We create the Kafka user which it will use. We specify the ACL rights for the different uh, operations which it needs to be able to do to communicate. 
and then at the end uh, we have uh, our own uh, Kafka Connect uh, resource here, which uh, will basically deploy the Kafka Connect application uh, for you. And uh, again, the operator will manage the Kafka Connect uh, workers and the ports and so on for you. So, uh, and the custom resource is very really similar. You specify slightly different things, but uh, the idea is the same. So let's uh, call OC apply on it to get it deploying. And in the meantime, let's uh, check a bit the code. So uh, one of the things which we are missing in uh, the demo, we have the events with the shares which we are buying and selling and what's the logical thing we would be interested in. The price which these shares have for which we can sell it or buy them, right? So uh, in the ideal case, I would now use a connector which will connect to some exchange and actually get the live feed of the data. Uh, I admit that I'm not really doing it because that's quite challenging with the time zones and so on. Also the US exchanges are still open at this time. So it's really just a, just a generator which generates the prices, but uh, basically what you need to implement when you write your own connector is these two classes. So there's this, uh, hope you can read it somehow. There's this connector class, which basically extends uh, some uh, class called source connector. And it pretty much implements few very simple method. One returns the version. One starts the connector, which in this case means we're just preparing some configuration for something called tasks. And then uh, there is some stop method. The more interesting thing is the, is the task, which again just extends some other class. And basically here you have some start method in the most simple implementation. Here we have some start method where you start a task, where you, for example, connect to the external application to receive the data. And then uh, you have this, uh, this poll method, which uh, the Kafka Connect framework will on its own periodically call, and you will just return in this poll method the messages which you received from the other system. Or uh, in case you will be writing the sync connector, there will be other method where you will basically receive uh, the messages. And uh, so it's really just implementing a very simple API. And uh, I actually used the Kubernetes friendly way, so the connector is already baked into the Docker image which I use for the Kafka Connect. So let me just uh, let's just see whether this works. So let me just check the plugins which I. Uh, <coughs> have uh, in my connect cluster and you can see that I have in total three plugins and this uh, price feed connector that's my uh, custom uh, plugin and now I have to create an instance of this connector so uh, this connector plugins that just means I uploaded the jar into the class path but I didn't create it yet an instance so to create it uh, the connector. That's one of the last things where we don't yet have an operator, but don't worry, we will get there because we like operators. So this is really a simple JSON which uh, configures the connector and all I need to do is to basically HTTP post it uh, into the Kafka Connect uh, API. And uh, that should get the connector running. You can see a state is running. And uh, to see that it's actually running, I also deployed uh, a very simple application which will show me the prices. So you can see some kind of randomly selected shares. And uh, you can see how it's uh, changing the prices when they are updating. Uh, and so on. Actually, they change the color, but it doesn't really how oh, it shows a bit there. So now we have the the trades which we have done. We have the prices, and guess what we will do uh, 
Next, we will count how much money we have there, because I'm quite sure we did the right trades and we are no millionaires. So let's talk a bit more about how you can uh, process the events which we have there. And basically, the Kafka Connect is great to move the data between the other systems in Kafka, but it doesn't really do any processing per se. So uh, we need something to take this data and do something useful with them. And uh, the great thing about Kafka is uh, that, as I said, it's kind of uh, very hyped, very popular. So uh, a lot of the different uh, machine learning and AI libraries support Kafka, and you can kind of directly connect them to Kafka to get this data and, for example, do some analysis uh, of uh, how the prices uh, are moving, whether there are some patterns which you should follow, and so on. Uh, quite often, these data are processed directly on Kafka, so to say, which basically means that you have some application which reads the data from one or more Kafka topics, does some processing to them, like some transformation, some joining of the data, and so on, and then writes the output again into one or more uh, Kafka topics uh, where some other applications can take them off and continue. And uh, there's also what's uh, used quite often is this uh, Stream table duality with Apache Kafka. Did anyone heard that term? Okay, some people. So for those who didn't, the messages in Kafka topics, they have always a key and a value. And already if you remember the first slide about Apache Kafka, what I said there was that uh, Apache Kafka is basically a distributed commit log. So, or you can also say transaction log, so we have key value, <laughs> transaction log, that means Kafka is pretty much a key value database, right, in a sense. So, this okay. stream table... Key is optional. Hmm? Key, is, key is optional. Yes, of course, that applies only when you use the keys. So, the way this works is that uh, when you have the streams of the trades, you can easily interpret them as a table, and it doesn't really show that well on this small screen. Let me see if I can play it somehow differently. Okay, that wasn't the right choice. It doesn't play the animation for some reason. For some reason, we have some imagination so we can present uh, this right, so animation. Let's just play it on the full screen and hopefully you will, uh, you will see it. So, pretty much the idea is that as you are getting the events here into the topic, you are actually kind of creating a table, right? So in this case, we are basically summing up all the events for Red Hat. And at the end, we get something like, uh, okay, after all these events, in total, you now own uh, 225 shares of Red Hat and 50 shares of uh, IBM. And for whatever reason, we gave up on the Amazon thing at the end. So uh, that's plus 10, minus 10, so at the end, it's zero Amazon shares. So this way, you can kind of take the stream and you can interpret it as a table. And uh, that's what we'll use in the next demo, where I will use something called uh, Kafka Streams, which is another part of the Apache Kafka project, and it's a very small and simple, but very handy stream processing library. I want to stress out that it's a library, not a framework, so it's not like, for example, Spark, where you have some workers, where you deploy some jobs and so on. But it's really just a library which you include into your pom.xml file or uh, Gradle or whatever and so on. And uh, you can use this to do different things like uh, data transformation, data aggregation. You can join different streams together. You can do things like windowing if uh, you don't really care about the whole uh, time but you want to 
see only some events in the last five minutes or in the last hour and so on. So all these things can be done with it. And what we'll do here is pretty much uh, we have the trades in the trades topic, we have the prices in the prices topic, and we will take these two topics. We will aggregate the topic with the trade, so that's pretty much what you saw in the animation. We will just take the events, create a table out of it, and then we will join it with the prices, because uh, once we know how many shares we have, we want to know how much money is in there. And then we just take this and dump this into another topic inside the Kafka cluster, where we can then uh, read these values and do some further processing or just set up some alert when we are finally rich enough to stop working. So, uh, let me first deploy the application. So that we can pull the images and so on. And let's quickly look into the source code. So this is pretty much uh, the whole application which does all the things on the previous slide. So as you can see, there's a main function, or this is actually the main function. So it's really just a library which I included into my very simple Java application, which is just the main function plus uh, some classes to configure uh, TLS and the connection to Kafka. But the actual application doing all the aggregation and the calculation, it's really these uh, 15 lines. There, what I do here first is uh, I create the table with the positions, where I basically say, take the stream of data, which comes from the topic with the trades, group it by the key, so that's the identifier of the company, and then uh, aggregate it. And because here we are basically summing it up, the aggregation is just take the previous value and add the new value to it. So that's basically what the animation was showing, where we take all these events and create a table out of them. Then we do something similar for the prices. The only difference is that we don't really need to aggregate them here because the prices, we care just about the last price right now. So uh, it will automatically take uh, the last price uh, for us from the stream. And then what we will really do is we will uh, let join these uh, two streams. And as the new value, we will call this calculate price uh, method. It's a separate method, but what it basically does, it checks uh, uh, for null values and uh, does uh, amount of shares which we have times the price, uh, the current value of the share on the exchange. And when we deploy it and get it running, then what we should see is uh, something like this, where now it did this uh, aggregation for us, but now instead of uh, telling us how many shares we own, it actually tells us how much money they are worth. And you can again see as the price generator is generating new prices every now and then, you can again see the value is basically updating because the Kafka Streams API is getting these updates from the Kafka topics and it's automatically recalculating uh, everything. And when I go now here to the UI which I had on the beginning and let's say uh, we buy the 10 Amazon shares, they will again, that will be sent into the topic with the trades and uh, from there it will propagate into the streaming application where it will automatically be aggregated and calculated and here we have now the Amazon uh, shares as well. So uh, you can do a lot more with the Kafka Stream API, but I think it's really super nice uh, how a uh, few lines of code can do a lot of heavy lifting. Right, so we are getting to the end. Uh, so I talked about these two open source projects. Uh, in Red Hat, uh, we have also this product called the MQ Streams, which basically provides support for this. Uh, that's not so interesting. Uh, maybe this is a bit more interesting for you, so if you are interested in the slides and the source code for the demos and so on, uh, this is the URL where you can go and find it. Uh, that's it. Any questions?
right. There was one question. Yeah, thank you, please. Uh, this service operator for Kafka. Uh, does it use state set or uh, how so does it uh, store the state state for, for Kafka mm -hmm. in Zookeeper? We use stateful set. For the other things like the Kafka Connect, which we saw, or the Kafka Mirror Maker, and so on, it's using regular deployments. And uh, yeah, so the stateful says that's what gives us the fixed identity and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You recommend uh, dozens of uh, smaller nodes, or let's say three or five, like beefy nodes with several um, gigs of memory. Uh, I would definitely recommend more to have the beefy nodes. Uh, uh, instead of many, many small nodes. So uh, it's not like I have any mathematics or anything to back it up. That's kind of my experience and my feeling, I would say. More. In my opinion, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that's some of the things. So for example, if you have a Kafka node, Kafka broker node, running with, I don't know, 64 gigs of memory. In reality, maybe like eight gigs of that uh, will be, sh should be used for the, for the heap memory, for the Java memory. The rest of that should be pretty much just reserved and used for the uh, kernel page cache, because that's what basically Kafka is using to get the speed when writing the records to disk and out of disk. It's pretty much relying quite heavily on this disk cache. So that it actually doesn't when the consumers are reading from the topics. In ideal case, it doesn't need to do any seeks on disk or anything like that, because these data should be still cached in this memory so that they can be quickly read from the memory. So yeah, it's kind of uh, where the beefier nodes might make more sense. How does it uh, play together? Uh, if we have uh, Kafka inside the uh, machine, and we are draining the node or any, anyhow brokers are migrating and coming and going away. And we have three applications which in case of uh, mm -hmm. broker is down or rebalancing. So, so the rebalancing will happen from time to time. But if you use replication, then uh, you will have some other copies of the topic and you are draining the node and moving the Kafka broker to another broker. Uh, to another worker node, then ultimately, if you use uh, replication, then the other nodes should take over and should uh, feed the clients while the one is moving, right? So you can use then the pod disruption budgets and things like that to specify that uh, only one of the Kafka brokers, for example, should be moving at a single time when you are draining the nodes and so on. Oh yeah, well, if you move to the node, then uh, yeah, the cache is lost and it has to be recovered from the list. Yeah, yeah. so do you have some comparison how uh, it is, uh, when I have, uh, let's say, Kafka on their method, where I'm only a user of that method, and then when I'm on uh, multiple levels of uh, uh, Docker, uh, so Kubernetes. I would say the bigger problem on things like Kubernetes and OpenShift, which is not really solved that well, or it's solved only in one way, uh, is that uh, while you can kind of use the Kubernetes limits and requests for the memory, the page cache is not really something that's allocated directly to the applications. And you can't really say like, this process should have this many gigabytes of a page cache. So if you really share the node for a lot of different workloads, you need to be a bit careful about what the other workloads are doing and uh, uh, make sure that kind of they are not doing something that's also intensive on the page cache, because otherwise it's a bit gambling who actually gets the page cache, right? So it's, uh, especially when you have a lot of traffic and you need a bigger cluster and so on, then ultimately, I would not just recommend to use beefy hosts or kind of beefier brokers. I would ultimately recommend you to use uh, dedicated nodes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and all of those stuff like how many memory should be committed, uh, it's configurable by the uh, resource definition, by custom resource. 
or you have to somehow um, think of it in advance and you know prepare the I don't know node uh, labels for nodes etc. So if you want to use dedicated hosts, mm -hmm. then uh, you need to prepare this sure. in advance, like set up the things, set up the labels for the selectors. But still, when I'm thinking about making a beefy uh, deployment, beefy bots, uh, regardless uh, if I have prepared nodes or not, I would just you know assume that I can allocate hmm? lots of memory. I can set it up into the uh, resource. So yeah, so ideally you should in the in the custom resource you yeah. should set up two things. Uh, and ideally you should do it even with small hosts mm -hmm. because uh, if you don't use requests and limits uh, yeah. Java doesn't behave that well to be honest. So ideally you should configure the resource request, mm -hmm. the limits, whatever, mm -hmm. but you should also use the JMX options, uh, mm -hmm. JVM options which we have there to configure the memory. Uh, we have there some algorithms to kind of, if you don't configure the JVM options for the maximum heap memory and so on, to kind of try to do some mathematics behind it. But probably you can do it maybe better. So it gives you the option to configure basically the X and X uh, values on your own to say, okay, this pod requests 64 gigs, but the X and X should be only this many gigs uh, for the Java memory and so on. Thank you. What's the price for operators, like, what, what kind, how much memory? You mean how much resources? Yeah. So, uh, it depends, in our case, it depends a bit how many different Kafka clusters are you running. Okay, in uh, the demo. But uh, in the demo, I think I give it something like, uh, let's check it actually. Might be easier. So, the cluster operator. So it has uh, 200 millicores as a request, one CPU as a limit, and it has 256 megabytes of uh, RAM. Uh, just out of interest, given the previous talk, uh, most operators are written in uh, Golang. Our is actually written in Java. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are using the fabricate file? Yes, we are using something called uh, Vertex which is a very nice reactive uh, Java framework and uh, that's kind of running the operator doing the eventing and the Fabricate uh, client is used to kind of interact with the Kubernetes and Autoshade APIs. With the operator switch on just Fabricate and Autoshade and can you do upgrades and advanced things? Yeah, so for example, it's, again, as I said, it's a bit different operator by operator. So our, our operator can do, for example, operates from one Kafka version to another, kind of take you through the process. Most of the advanced can do this in one way or another as well. Uh, our ex core West colleagues are always showing this uh, maturity chart for operators. Uh, I would say we are somewhere in the middle with the Strunzi project right now, but what we, for example, want to have uh, hopefully later this year is uh, this uh, more automated cluster balancing so that the operator is kind of shifting the topics uh, around the cluster to give you the optimal performance depending on what you specify, I don't know, best throughput or maybe you want to have best disk utilization and so on. So. Uh, uh, what we hope to add to it uh, towards the end of this year is more intelligence to kind of move the topics around the cluster to optimize how it's used and how it performs. Some kind of configuration profiles? Yeah. Or tuning? Yeah, kind of. Kind of auto tuning, yeah. Okay, <coughs> no more questions? Could you share some success stories or actual production deployments of Strinzy? Because on the internet you can find dozens of pages uh, to build three ambos and it just runs. And is it really that seamless? For yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure how much I can share or probably cannot share about the uh, outside customers. For example, in Red Hat we have uh, something called Data Hub, uh, which is kind of collecting different internal data, which is using now the Streams operator for uh, quite a long time, I think. Uh, but to be honest, I don't have right now any numbers or anything like that, which would be 
which I can present. But it's it's used uh, in production by different customers. Can you like some? I don't know what the rules are, to be honest. I'm an engineer. <laughs> 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 exactly, that's the, that's the problem. Well, you said many customers are using that. Are they using it properly or misusing it? Because Kafka is really high. And so, people are saying. Yeah, that's kind of a big problem, which. Uh, Kafka is really hyped, and uh, don't get me wrong, Kafka is a great tool for a lot of use cases. And great to be for presentations. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if someone tells you a story about how the messaging was done completely wrong for the last 30 years or 50 years or whatever, and then Kafka came and saw it all, that's bullshit, right? <laughs> so uh, ultimately there are different use cases where different tools uh, work uh, better or worse and there's a lot of customers who kind of come oh hey we want to have the Kafka thing because that's the thing which is in right now and everyone's talking about it and so on okay tell us what do you want to use it for oh we want to use it for request response right <laughs> no it's not really the place where you should use it that doesn't really work and there's a lot of uh, similar things but I think that at the end uh, Hopefully most of them recognize that uh, it's a great tool for some tasks and not for all tasks. Okay. <laughs> Just uh, I would say uh, when, uh, if you are uh, say uh, watching those customers. Uh, where in your let's say streams uh, operator where they are failing the most? What, what are the uh, lessons learned that you can give us from using the streams? Usually it's monitoring to be honest. I actually deployed my Grafana here, but it didn't really show it. It uh, yeah it doesn't show that much uh, uh, here on the local OC cluster up. But I think the most problems uh, I heard of kind of where something stopped working were things like, uh, oh hey, let's not monitor how much this free disk space do we have uh, on the persistent <laughs> volumes, right? And then they uh, get full and uh, yeah, it kind of stops working. So that's, I would say, it's the most common. So it's like, uh, yeah, monitoring, monitoring, uh, monitoring is probably the most uh, important thing. I actually never tried it, but as far as I know, you can uh, get JMX metrics out of it, and uh, you can convert them to Prometheus metrics and use them in Prometheus. For and these JMX metrics are specific to the business logic, or is it some generic? Like I think that's by default it's more generic uh, for the Kafka Streams application. If you want something more specific, then uh, ultimately you can also uh, query the things. Uh, so that's it's not written as a library just because you put it into a main function and then run it without anything. You can do things like. Uh, actually interacting with the streams application to get additional information or for example I kind of uh, did the simple and easy way I wrote a separate web UI to show the data but you can actually in the same application where the stream application is running you can kind of query the data stores and so on so you can do a lot of things there as well Maybe you start to take Okay, I guess uh, that was the last, last question. This nice dashboard you get for free on the chip or you have to deploy it? The, that's just Grafana and Prometheus. I just deployed it here. 
I think the actual... Is it part of operator? Okay. So we ship it together with the operator. The operator exposes the matrix to... Yeah, so we ship, we, we ship the Grafana dashboards and uh, we have their support for export for Prometheus but kind of on... Uh, is the idea is more that instead of us deploying the Prometheus for you, you bring your own Prometheus deployment to kind of plug it in. We ship the Grafana dashboards, it means you, are, you ship the JSON yeah, exactly. of the dashboard. So exactly. you are so much as the Grafana and importing this dashboard. Yeah. Okay. And then we kind of support it from the other end, where in this custom resource for Kafka, you can basically, we are using this G JMX exporter to convert the JMX metrics to uh, Prometheus, so we can configure that there. And then kind of the stuff in between, which is Prometheus and Grafana, it's kind of what you have to supply. Or there is some stuff built into OpenShift and so on, but uh, on Kubernetes, for example, that's kind of what you bring in. Okay, thanks.